Hello brothers and sisters in Christ. Today we're going to be talking about the kingdom of God versus the kingdom of God. And as we get into this study, we're going to be talking basically, we're going to be talking about the physical kingdom and the spiritual kingdom. Okay? And we're going to see how the spiritual kingdom is connected to us today and looking for that blessed hope. Just a little part where I'm just throwing this out now. It's not really in the studies. We're just going to talk about rightly dividing between the two. There's kingdom of God as its reference to the spiritual, kingdom of God as its reference to the, the physical. But more I look into it, the kingdom of God as it references the spiritual, we're supposed to be looking for that blessed hope. It's tied in with looking for that blessed hope. So the hymn I have for this morning was going to be, When the Roll is Called Up Yonder. Good old hymn. I like it. Hopefully I can sing pretty good this morning. Some mornings I have a that gravel voice. Forgive me. But if you want to look up, When the Roll is Called Up Yonder. When the trumpet of the Lord shall sound, and time shall be no more, and the morning breaks eternal, bright and fair, when the saved of earth shall gather over on the other shore, and the roll is called up yonder, I'll be there. When the roll is called up yonder, when the roll, when the roll is called up yonder, when the roll is called up yonder, when the roll is called up yonder, I'll be there. On that bright and cloudless morning, when the dead in Christ shall rise, and the glory of His resurrection share. When His chosen ones are gathered to their home beyond the skies, and the roll is called up yonder, I'll be there. When the roll is called up yonder, when the roll, when the roll is called up yonder, when the roll is called up yonder, when the roll is called up yonder, I'll be there. Let us labor from the master from the dawn till setting sun, let us walk of all his wondrous love and care. Then when all of life is over and our work on earth is done, and the roll is called up yonder, I'll be there. When the roll is called up yonder, when the roll is called up yonder, when the roll, when the roll is called up yonder, when the roll is called up yonder, I'll be there. Brothers of Christ, we get into this subject, and it just seems like I've lost fellowship with some brethren because they got in an argument over the physical kingdom versus the spiritual kingdom. Brother says Christ, we're supposed to be looking for that blessed hope. That's where our eyes are supposed to be on, and a lot of people's eyes are on that physical kingdom. The kingdom of heaven, the kingdom of God, is referring to the physical kingdom. They've got their eyes on the time of Jacob's trouble. Our eyes are not supposed to be on the time of Jacob's trouble. Our eyes are supposed to be on that blessed hope. We're supposed to be living for that blessed hope. Working, as we just sung in that hymn, until our work is done on earth. We're here working for the Lord. We're, we're working towards that judgment seat of Christ that happens after the catching away. It's called the day of Christ, the day of redemption, that blessed hope, and the event going up, we're caught up. Okay? And we go to the judgment seat of Christ. That's where our eyes are supposed to be on. So as we get into this study, I know I might be stepping on some people's toes. Okay? Here's the thing. We're supposed to be make sure. We, the thing is, is, I've lost fellowship with brethren, brother, sis, Christ, when we both agree that right now we're in the kingdom of God, that spiritual kingdom, that spiritual fellowship. That's where we are. We agree on that. But we start disagreeing when it comes to other dispensations. That's still not worth breaking fellowship over. But now that I've got that out, Brothers of Christ, this isn't worth breaking fellowship over. This is called truth, and this is what God has showed me. And if God's shown you something, by all means, put it in the comment section. If you disagree with me, you can come talk with me. You can let, maybe leave a comment in the comment section. But remember, in meekness, instructing those that oppose themselves, you've got to be gentle. You've got to do it with love. You've got to do it with meekness. Patient, apt to teach. Turn it into a teaching mode. Don't be a person that just attacks in the comment section. That's what causes a lot of the division. People just want to attack, attack, attack. You, they want to talk at you, but they have the hardest time talking to you. Okay? We need to be talking to each other, not at each other. You know, being at each other's throats, that, that, that phrase you hear saying. So let's really get into this. 2 Timothy 
Turn to 2 Timothy 2.15. Some of us have this memorized, but some of us have forgotten this at the same time. 2 Timothy, I'm in 1 Timothy. We need to get 2 Timothy 2.15. Study to show thyself approved unto God, a workman that needeth not to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. And I'm going to show you today that there's a difference between kingdom of God and kingdom of God. <laughs> okay, How it's used determines what it means. And there's a difference. When you have it used over here, we're going to prove that it's, it's the physical kingdom. When you have it used over here, we're going to prove it's the spiritual kingdom. Okay. But we have to rightly divide. And there's some people who don't want to rightly divide. You got, I forgot what it's called, like uniform translation, where some people say, well, if you see the phrase kingdom of God, and you find the definition you like, because a word can have more than one definition, and what they do is they say, no, 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 a word can only have one definition throughout the whole time it's used. That's called uniform translation, and that's not true. It's not true. Okay. Words have different meanings. Okay. You can have the word uh, post. That was the one that was given to you by my mentor. Post. Okay. Post can mean, depending on how it's used, it can mean a wooden post. It can be a soldier standing at his post. You have a post office. You put a post on something because it's about ready to go somewhere, like letter. So posts can be used different ways. There's different definitions. And the Bible says we're to rightly divide. We have different dispensations where a word can be used one way in this dispensation and a word can be used differently, have a different definition in this dispensation. And we're going to show that that's the case here with the kingdom of God versus the kingdom of God. Uh, 2 Timothy 3.16, I think it is. Yeah, 3.16 it says, All Scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness, that the man of God may be perfect, thoroughly furnished unto all good works. Those are good Scriptures to get memorized. 2 Timothy 2.15 and 2 Timothy 3.16. Okay. And that's what we're going to do. We're going to be going through this. So let's start this out with Romans. Because it's the biggest thing. They always run to Romans 14, 17, and then they'll, they'll use this as a uniform translation for any time you see kingdom of God. So turn to Romans 14. Wow. Romans 14, verse 17. I'm sorry. Yeah, Romans 14, verse 17. We see here, this is Paul, I call it, it's called the Pauline Epistles, it's Paul, and it's in the book of Romans, and he says, For the kingdom of God is not meat and drink, but righteousness and peace and joy in the Holy Ghost. For he that is in these things serveth Christ is acceptable to God and approved of men. And see, they'll grab this and say, well, you see there, that's the main definition of kingdom of God. So anytime you see kingdom of God mentioned, it's the spiritual kingdom. There's just one thing that they leave out. When you read this, what do we read? It says, For the kingdom of God is not meat and drink, drink, but righteousness and peace and joy in the Holy Ghost. You have to have the Holy Ghost to be part of the spiritual kingdom. You have to have the Spirit of God in you. Remember Paul talks about in Romans 8, If the Spirit of God dwell in you, about the contrast between someone who's lost, carnally minded, and walking after the flesh, versus someone who's saved, spiritually minded, and walking after the Spirit. They have the Holy Spirit of God in them. That's the difference. And you can tell. Don't get me wrong, sometimes it's hard to tell, but if you keep at it, you can tell when someone has the Holy Spirit and when someone doesn't have the Holy Spirit. But to be part of this kingdom of God, the spiritual kingdom, you have to have the Holy Spirit in you. Now right there, they'll be like, uh, I got into it and talked with some brethren. When I mean got into it, I mean got into a serious Bible study. and It was pretty neat, and it was, it was great and joyful. And we got into it, we started going through the Old Testament, trying to figure out, hmm, who, who all ha was part of this kingdom of God? Who all actually had the Holy Spirit, where it was a permanent thing? Nobody. Nobody in the Old Testament had the Holy Spirit when and it was a permanent thing. Like today, when we get sealed into the day of redemption, no there's no sins unto death today. 
There's no amount of, we're going to get into how sin can get in the way of your fellowship with the Lord, but no amount of sin today is going to get God to go, okay, I'm taking my Holy Spirit from you. Do you remember King David in the Psalms? He said, take not thy Holy Spirit from me. God would give his Holy Spirit to certain men in the Old Testament, but he could, and he would take it back. Or he could take it back if you fail them with certain sins unto death. Okay? So we start going through the Old Testament. Just out of curiosity, we're like, well, who was the first person to have the Holy Spirit in them? And we start going through and we're trying to, the first time uh, the Spirit, the Bible even mentions the Spirit of God dwelling with somebody, it's talking about the Spirit of Wisdom. If you remember the seven spirits of God, this isn't part of the study in the notes, but just a side thing. The seven spirits of God, one of those spirits is the Spirit of Wisdom. And you have Moses and God's teaching him how to make the tabernacle, how to make the breastplate for the, the Levitical priesthood, the high priest. And he says, he, I've chosen these men that I put my spirit of wisdom, doesn't necessarily mean the Holy Spirit, but the spirit of wisdom is put upon him. And as you go down, you find out that we, we, we did that study, we might do it in the future, but we talked about how Moses did have the Holy Spirit of God in him. And God took a portion of his spirit and put it on like 70 elders. And as it put him on the 70 elders, it says the spirit of God came upon him. And they prophesied. So he's not actually taking Moses' spirit. He's talking about the Holy Spirit that's in Moses. He's sharing it with these 70 elders. Okay? So there are people in the Old Testament that had the Holy Spirit in them. And they had that spiritual fellowship with God that the, the average man didn't have. Today, anybody who gets saved, this is what I mean by the average man, anybody who gets saved today has that spiritual fellowship, has, can be part of that kingdom of God. In the Old Testament, there's only a few people, and most time it was temporary. There's very, even very few people that had. There was good people, good people that loved the Lord, feared the Lord, kept the laws of Moses, pleased God, that didn't have the Holy Spirit. And yet you have these false teachings that go back and say, well, the kingdom of God and the kingdom of heaven, there's, the, you know, and they go through every dispensation trying to prove where the kingdom of God's there, and it's not when it comes to the spiritual. It's not. It's not there for everyone. It's only there for a certain amount of people. But the point I'm trying to make with what we're reading here, it's joy, it's righteousness, peace, and joy in the Holy Ghost. You have to have the Holy Spirit of God in you to be part of this kingdom that Paul's talking about. And more than anything, Paul's saying, hey, today the kingdom of God is not meat and drink. He didn't say in the Old Testament the kingdom of God was not meat and drink. He said, he's talking about today, this dispensation. That's, uh, okay, let's, 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 let's trade over to the physical, okay, where it's mentioned and it's talking about physical kingdom and prove it. Luke 17, turn to Luke 17. Luke 17, this is one of the biggest ones that really just a smack to the face to those who just don't want to give up. They want the kingdom of God to be the spiritual kingdom across the board in every dispensation. And it's not. Luke 17. Luke 17, verse 20. Luke 17, 20. Or st yeah, start with 20. Over here. Start with 20. And when he was demanded of the Pharisees when the kingdom of God should come, he answered them and said, The kingdom of God cometh not with observation. See the word, the kingdom of God is being used. Not with observation. They're wanting signs. That's what they're talking about, signs. They'll say, see, it's not physical. No, he's talking about signs. The Jews require a sign. What sign showest thou that thou art the Christ, the Son of God, that thou hast the authority to do what you're doing and say what you're saying? You read this all about what Jesus had to go through with the Pharisees, the Sadducees, the scribes, the high priest at that time. The kingdom of God cometh not with observation. Neither shall they say, Lo here or lo there, for behold, the kingdom of God is within you. People will grab this verse and say, See, it's within you. It's spiritual. It's spiritual. And they'll stop right there. They don't dare keep reading they don't dare get the context of what's going on here. Because if they did, they'd find out, and we're going to talk about it, what that in you means. 
It's not talking about the spiritual kingdom. Let's keep reading. How about we keep reading and get the context, rightly dividing the word of truth. Behold, the kingdom of God is within you. And he said unto his disciples, how often, it's the same subject. They'll say, no, it's a different subject. No, it's the same subject. How often did he reprove the, the Pharisees and Sadducees, but he turned around and taught his disciples? For them it is known, to, for them I'll speak in parables, but for you is it known to know the truth. And he, and he teaches them. All these different parables he's telling them, and he's going after them. Remember they came to Jesus and said, Know you not that you offended the Pharisees? Sometimes they got it. Jesus didn't have to really explain it to them. They like, okay, you really offended the, the Pharisees and the Sadducees and the scribes. But he turns to his disciples, he said unto his disciples, The days will come when ye shall desire to see one of the days of the Son of Man. Let that sink in. Ye shall not see it. We've talked about this time and time again, brother, sis, Christ. I get in trouble because in the Old Testament where it says Adam, it says man was created in the image of God, man and woman was created in the likeness of God. And they'll try to, today you hear all these teachings that man and women are made in the image of God. No, they're not. Only man was made in the image of God. Man and woman were made in the likeness of God. Likeness is body, soul, and spirit. The image of God is something you can see. It's just talking about the flesh. Remember, we're body, soul, and spirit. You can't see a soul. You can't see a spirit. So when it talks about the image, image is something you can see. It's only talking about the body. God is a man. Adam is a man. Now, it's not in my notes, but in, in the Pauline epistles, Paul comes back and talks about how man, once again, man was created in the image of God, but the woman was taken from the man. Woman wasn't made in the image of God. She was made in the likeness of God, body, soul, and spirit. Image is something you can see. It's flesh. It's physical. You see here that it talks about desire of the one of the days of the Son of Man. Ye shall not see it. They're asking for signs to show us. They want to see something. Flesh, physical, a miracle, a sign, a wonder. They want something they can see. Physical, flesh. The same thing that's said here is the Son of Man, not the Son of God. It's not talking about Jesus being God the Father manifest in the flesh. The Son of, capital S, Son of Man, sometimes referred to, it's very rare, but it's a few times it said Son of David, capital S, Son of David. This is referring to Jesus Christ being the Messiah, the Christ, the Son of the living God, their King. Mainly their King, the Messiah, the Christ, their King. This is talking about Son of David. Anytime you see Son of Man, capital S Son of Man, it's talking about Jesus' family line from Mary going back to King David and Mary's marriage, because when Mary married Joseph, she's now engrafted into his family line. So the Bible gives us his family line all the way back to King David. There's no questioning. This is going back to King David. This is talking about the physical kingdom when he comes in to rule and reign, when he sets up his kingdom. It says, the days of the Son of Man, and ye shall not see it. It's physical. It's not spiritual. It's physical. Let's keep going. And they shall say to you, see here, or see there, go not after them. Remember what he just said to the, the Pharisees? Not come, comes not with observation? Or see there, go not after them, nor follow them. Here it is. For as the lightning that lightened out of the one part under heaven shineth unto the other part under heaven, so shall also the capital S Son of Man be in His day. Remember, Jesus kept preaching that He's going to come back as a thief in the night. He's going to catch people unaware. I'm talking about the end of the time of Jacob's trouble. It's talking about the time of Jacob's trouble, the end of it, Jesus comes back as a thief in the night. No one knows when he's going to come back. You just got to keep looking for it. Not for us, but for those who go into that time period. Just like with us, let's go with us today, the spiritual kingdom. We're looking for that blessed hope. We don't know when it's going to happen. But we're supposed to look for it. And there's some brethren out there who've turned their back on looking, present tense, for that blessed hope. They go back and try to tell you Paul wasn't looking for it. Yes, he was. 
Why would Paul T. tell us where to look for it, but he himself is above it? And the people, like the early Christians, are above No, everyone was looking for it. Not, what I mean by everyone, everyone was told to look for it. I'll say it like that. Everyone was told to look for it. You still have people that stop looking for it and get distracted by the world. But it says, the Son of Man be in his day. His day. It's talking about the time of Jacob's trouble and the day of the Lord when the Lord comes back. The Lord's day, the day of the Lord. When he comes back. Okay. Verse 25 says, but first... But first must suffer many things and be rejected of this generation. So before Jesus comes back, it's talking about the time of Jacob's trouble. He starts going down. You can start going down and reading. It says, and as it was in the days of Noe, so shall it be also in the days of the Son of Man. They did eat. They drank. They married wives. They were given in marriage until the day that Noe entered into the ark and the flood came and destroyed them all. The time of Jacob's trouble. He's talking about before the time of Jacob's trouble. You see all this stuff happening? And then it was it's just upon them. There are no signs. There are no observations. It's just the time of Jacob's trouble. When it starts, it starts. Think about that. Today you have a lot of brethren getting distracted by what's going on in the world. And they're trying to look for all these signs and wonders of when, and these observations of when the time of Jacob's trouble is going to come in. It's going to catch them off guard. It's going to catch them off guard because we're supposed to be working towards that blessed hope. And they're not doing it. They're getting distracted. But this says there are no observations. We can look and say, hey, this might be the mark of the beast, or this might be the one world order, or this might be this, or this might be that. It's a waste of time. It's not going to come in with observation. It's going to come in, boom. And he's talking to the Jewish people, but it's just going to happen. When God says it's time, it's time. And it's just going to happen. We're going to get caught up, the man of sin gets revealed, and starts, because he opened that first seal, and it starts the time of Jacob's trouble. But you have all these people that, we need signs, we, gotta, we, gotta, we need observations, which they get distracted from what matters. And what matters is living a life of Christ today. Back then, what mattered was, is you needed to get water baptized, remember this is the Old Testament, you need to get water baptized, uh, and uh, repent, and be water baptized for the mission of sins, and you need to believe that and get your life cleaned up, get your life right with God. So you, you repent and get water baptized, and afterwards you start clean, letting God clean up your life. You turn back to God, doing things God's way, you know, the Levitical laws. You get back to being right with God. And you had to believe that Jesus was the Christ, the, the, the Messiah, which is called Christ, the Christ, the Son of the living God. And you had to be patient, and you had to wait for him to bring in that kingdom. They weren't being patient. They wanted it now. Right now. Verse 28. Likewise also as it was in the days of Lot, they did eat, they drank, they bought, they sold, they planted, they builded. But the same day that Lot went out of Sodom, it rained fire and brimstone from heaven and destroyed them all. This isn't talking about a spiritual kingdom. It's talking about physical kingdoms. Destroyed them all. Even thus shall it be in the day when the Son of Man is revealed. He comes back. Mm -hmm. 31. And that day he which shall be upon the housetop, his stuff in the house, let him not come down to take it away. And he that is in the field, let him likewise not return back. Remember Lot's wife, who swore shall, you know, she turned back, turned to a pillar of salt. She looked back. She started having sorrow. Oh, we, do we have to live the, leave this wicked life and, and this sinful wicked life and, and this wicked city and everything? She looked back. 33. Who swore shall seek to save his life shall lose it, and who swore shall lose his life shall preserve it. I tell you that in one night there shall be two men in one bed. The one shall be taken, the other shall be left. Some of us know these verses. It's talking about the Battle of Armageddon. Okay. It's talking about that 200 million man army that gets thrown out there real quick because Jesus is coming back to face Jesus. Okay. One man is in the bed, one shall be taken, the other one's left. Two women shall be grinding together, the other shall be taken, and the other left. One shall be taken, and the other left. Two men shall be in the field, and the one shall be taken, and the other left. And they answered and said unto him, Where, Lord? 
And he said unto them, Wherever the body is, thither will the eagles be gathered together. The battle of Armageddon talks about how the eagles are going to feed on their flesh. The birds of the air are going to feed on their flesh. Now you get through all this and you're like, okay, it's, it's really hardcore, physical, physical. It's talking about the time of Jacob's trouble and Jesus coming back and he starts his rule, reign. But this stuff's got to happen before he can come back. Um, and there's no observation. In other words, when it happens, it happens. I remember another part I talked about how like a woman that travaileth with child, she, she could be eight, nine months pregnant. Or I said pregnant, forgive me. With child, that's the proper term. With child, even I'm working on getting some of the worldly terms out. Uh, with child, okay? And when she starts, you know, uh, with the pains of childbirth, when that starts, it just comes on suddenly. There's no signs. There's no observations. One minute she could be doing something and be, feel like she's just fine. And the next minute, she goes into birthing pains. That's how that's going to be. That's what he's talking about. So you go all the way back to where it talked about the kingdom of God is within you. People say, well, then why would God say the kingdom of God is within you? I know Brother in Christ, 33rd book, has a great teaching on this, on Enoch, high-flying Enoch. And he goes through and he really explains it, which is really great. Um, he talks about there's three groups of people that had to accept Jesus Christ for him to bring in the kingdom. You had his disciples. And if you read the story, he had all his, his, uh, his disciples. Eventually, they, the, uh, the, the majority of them turned, turned, turned away from him. There's a story in there where he had his 12 apostles, where he sent them out two by two. And then he sent out 70 disciples two by two. Ned talks about the story where he talks about his flesh is meat and he's drinking of his, of his blood and he's eating his flesh and he's talking spiritually. And they couldn't handle it and they all leave. All the, the, the disciples leave. And all that's left is the 12 apostles. And then you read about the 12 apostles. The night that Jesus gets taken, they all fled. They all turned on him. One even denied him three times. So it started out, they did accept him, but they didn't wait. They weren't patient. They didn't wait. And over time, doubt set in, and the next thing you know, they, they started hearing things they couldn't understand, and they left. They got fearful of the world, and they fled from Jesus. That was the first group. The second group was the common people. The common people were turning to him and believing. That first week when he comes marching in, on the donkey, they were they were crying, Hosanna in the highest. They were calling him Hosanna in the highest. They were worshiping him. He's the, he's the Messiah. He's the Christ. He's the King. And then a week later, the religious crowd had turned the people, got them to turn their backs on him. Okay, maybe he's not the King because the kingdom hasn't gotten brought in. A week ago, where's the kingdom? We wanted it. We want it now. They weren't patient. And a week later, they turned on him and they're yelling, Crucify him! Crucify him! Then you had that third group, the religious crowd. I mean, the re religious leaders, the Pharisees, the Sadducees, the scribes, the, the high priest. That third group always rejected him. That third group never accepted him. In fact, they were telling people that if you, if you confess that Jesus is the Christ, we'll put you out of the synagogues. We'll put you out of the temple. We'll put you out of the synagogues. They're looking for excuses to stone people if they confess that Jesus was the Christ, like the blind man. You know, they finally just, that the was, the was, uh, was born blind and God healed him. They're looking for an excuse to go after Jesus and to go after anybody like that. Now the guy never confessed that he was the Christ because he didn't know who Jesus was, but they ended up throwing him out. So you have these three groups. So the first group accepted him at first, his, his apostles, his disciples. The people accepted him at first before they turned away. And then you had that religious crowd. Who was holding off the kingdom of God? The religious crowd. So when he's sitting here saying that the kingdom of God is within you, he's talking about the Pharisees, not all Jews. He's talking about the Pharisees. That's who's questioning him. 
you're the one holding it back. Your unbelief. Your rejection of the truth. You're keeping the kingdom of heaven from coming, a kingdom of God from coming in. It's within you. It's up to you. And they refused, rejected, rejected, and then they finally crucified Jesus Christ. So as you read there, they'll try to grab that and say, well, it says it's within you, so it has to be the spiritual kingdom. But we just read the whole context. Son of man has to do with the physical kingdom. His day, the Lord's day, the day of the Lord, is talking about the physical kingdom. Don't be deceived. And, and I've made the mistake before, way, way back when, because I heard someone say it, it sounded good because they just read those two verses. The kingdom of God is a uh, kingdom of God, yeah, kingdom of God is in you. It's the spiritual. No, it isn't. It's the physical. Okay? Where are these people? And it says the kingdom of God is within you to the Pharisees. Do the Pharisees have the Holy Spirit of God? No. Did the average person have the Holy Spirit of God when Jesus was preaching the kingdom of heaven, the kingdom of God? No. John the Baptist had the Holy Spirit, and Jesus had the Holy Spirit. Now, I believe, like in the Old Testament, the Holy Spirit can come down. If you remember the story, because I was talking this with some brethren, not to go off too much, but you remember the story of Saul, where he's hunting down King David. And he sends out a group of people, and King David is with uh, Samuel, and the group of people that go to get him, the Holy Spirit falls upon them. Right when they're going to grab King David and Saul, or Samuel, the Holy Spirit falls upon them, and they fall down on their knees and prophesy. And then they go back without taking, going, uh, without taking King David or killing him. So then Saul sends a second group. Same thing. The Holy Spirit comes down. They fall and prophesy. The Holy Spirit leaves, and they get up, and they come back. Then you have Saul himself go down there. This is after the Holy Spirit had left him, because he had the Holy Spirit at the beginning. It left him, and then an evil spirit came to, to torment him. He went after him, and it says that he fell on the earth, took his clothes off, fell on the earth naked. This is a king. It was humbling. It was a king, and made him humble himself before King David and Samuel. The Holy Spirit came upon him. It was temporary. Now, in the Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, when he sends out his 12 apostles, and they're healing, and they're casting out devils, and I can't remember if they raised the dead, but I believe the Holy Spirit was upon them temporary. God gave, it says God gave, Jesus gave them the power to do this, to do it. It's the Holy Spirit. And it left when they came back. Okay, we did the job he said, we came back, here's the story, and it left. Same thing with those 70 disciples that he sent out two by two and did the same thing. And they were preaching water baptism, repent and be water baptized for the remissions of sins. And they're preaching that the kingdom of heaven, also called the kingdom of God, is at hand. And we're going to prove this. But for the most part, you look through here, the only people that had the Holy Spirit where it was almost like a permanent thing was John, even though you could still lose it. But you had John was born with the Holy Spirit from Elizabeth, his mother's womb. Jesus, I believe, was born with the Holy Spirit. When, it, when people get confused because the Holy Spirit comes down like as a dove, that's a sign for John. We already had studies on this and proved it's a sign for John, the Baptist, the only Baptist. Okay? But people didn't have the Holy Spirit. So how could he be talking to the Pharisees who don't have the Holy Spirit and say that the kingdom of God, the spiritual kingdom, is within you? What did we read up there with Paul? For the kingdom of God is not meat and drink. It's not physical. But righteousness, peace, and joy in the Holy Ghost. You have to have the Spirit of God in you. Did they have the Spirit of God in them? No. There was people in the Old Testament. Moses had the Holy, the Holy Spirit of God. There was King David had the Spirit of God in him. And he kept praying, take not thy Holy Spirit from me. Because he did some offenses that were worth taking the Holy Spirit from him. Okay. There were some people that did have that spiritual fellowship, but not everybody had it. Okay. So there you have the physical. It's talking about the physical. Don't be confused. Let's bounce back over to the spiritual. 1 Corinthians. 1 Corinthians. 1 Corinthians chapter 6. 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 9. 
Know ye not that the unrighteous shall not inherit the kingdom of God? Now stop. This is not, we're going to get into it, this is not saying you have to be sinlessly perfect in order to get saved and get the Holy Spirit and be part of that kingdom of God. It's not saying that when you get it, the moment you sin, you lose it. We're going to keep going. Know ye not that the unrighteous shall not inherit the kingdom of God? Be not deceived. Neither fornicators, nor idolaters, nor adulterers, nor effeminate, nor abusers of themselves with mankind, nor thieves, nor covetous, nor drunkards, nor revilers, nor extortioners shall inherit the kingdom of God. Verse 11 is talking about the spiritual kingdom. What gets in the way of your walk with the Lord? Sin. Lust of the flesh. Worldliness. Sin, iniquity. Verse 11, And such were some of you. God saves you. You're going to have sin in your life. But God's going to help you get it out. He's going to help you clean up your life. And I told people with my testimony, there were, there's times where I fought God on giving up sin. And of course God had to smack me around a little bit to get me back on the to get me to let go. Called chastening of the Lord. But there's times where fighting. Does that mean I'm not saved? Yes, I'm saved. I have the Holy Spirit in me. And I've, we've said this before. All sin is negative. Anytime after I got saved, when I gave something up, when I turned around and tried to grab it back, it gets in the way of my walk with the Lord. It gets in the way of my prayer life. It gets in the way of my Bible reading life, my Bible studying life, understanding the Word of God. I start making a mess of the Word of God. I see a lot of men on YouTube that do that. They start getting into, back into worldliness. Sin, they get distracted by like lust of the flesh, covetousness, idolatry, things down here that they're holding above the Lord. Uh, they get distracted by the time of Jacob's trouble. And what happens is they start making a mess of this book. God stops showing them things in here. Why? Because they're not part of that physical, their fellowship with the Lord is hurting. It's come to a stop. It can get going again. But it's come to a stop. And such were some of you, but are you? But ye are washed, but ye are sanctified, but ye are justified in the name of the Lord Jesus and by the Spirit of our God. You still have the Holy Spirit in you, but it affects your walk with the Lord. That's what it's talking about there when it says, "Not shall not inherit the kingdom of God." It goes back to talking about the spiritual. One thing you'll catch on here is. When it's talking about the spiritual, it's pretty much talking about it in the Pauline epistles. Latter book of, latter book of Acts and the Pauline epistle. Okay. When it's talking about the kingdom of God and, and the early book of Acts, and Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, it's primarily talking about the physical kingdom. It's not talking about the spiritual. This is talking about the spiritual. Because it says, And such were some of you, but ye are washed, but ye are sanctified, but ye are justified, in the name of our Lord Jesus and by the Spirit of our God. Today the just shall live by faith, not good works. Good works follow. They're evidence of that faith. But we're not justified by our works. They were in the kingdom of heaven gospel. They are justified. By the kingdom of God as it refers to the physical kingdom. They are justified by works. And faith is on the side. That's the book of James. Going back into the time of James Charles, don't want to get too confused, but today, today, we're justified by faith, not by works. Both are there, absolutely. You start getting into sin and wickedness, it's going to affect your walk with the Lord. But Paul talks about today, as he's going over it, today the kingdom of God. It's talking about righteousness, peace, and joy in the Holy Ghost. What gets in the way of righteousness, peace, and joy in the Holy Ghost? For the kingdom of God today, sin. Wickedness, worldliness, iniquity. Okay. There is a spiritual side to the kingdom of God, and there's a physical side to the kingdom of God. We rightly divide. This isn't talking about a physical kingdom. It's talking about a spiritual kingdom. Let's bounce back over to the physical. Mark 14. Turn to Mark 14. Notice where I'm going a lot for the kingdom of God and when it talks about it as the physical kingdom. Mark 14. There's another hard one for them to swallow when it comes to dealing with truth. Mark 14 25 says, Verily I say unto you, I will drink no more of the fruit of the vine 
Fruit of the vine. That's talking about where they take, the, let's just use grapes, but it can be any fruit, but grapes. You take the grapes directly from the vine, you squeeze it into the cup, and you drink it. Then there's taking grapes from the vine, squeezing them into a barrel, and you put some preservatives in it to make it last longer. And it's still, it's still grape juice, but it's now fermented grape juice, so it lasts longer. Then there's taking grapes, putting stuff in there that make it turn into alcohol, and it becomes you know, a strong drink. Those are the three processes. But when he's saying for more fruit from the vine, he's talking about straight from the vine. He's just talking about grape juice, but fresh grape juice. Now, I got with the neighbors, and they had this machine, and I was helping them with all their apples. And he was showing me how he does the apples, and I had apple juice freshly squeezed straight from the apple. It was before we put it in jars, and it was before we boiled it. We didn't even put any preservatives in there. It's just... Because today we've got glass, we've got steel, we've got ways to really airtight seal it. And we don't really need to put any preservatives in it. So we put it in the jars, we have to boil it and get the temperature up to a certain degree. And then we put the jars to the side and they self-seal. Because the pressure, as it cools down, it pressures and sucks it back down. And it seals the, the, the jar. And then you can put it up in the, in the cabinet and it will be good for two, three, four years. But I got to have some straight off the, the apple, and it was amazing. That's what this is talking about. I will drink no more of the fruit of the vine until the day that the till the day that I drink it new in the kingdom of God. Well, it's the spiritual kingdom. No, it's not. Paul says, for the kingdom of God is not meat and drink. Physical for today. It's not physical, it's spiritual. But here Jesus is saying, I'm going to drink physically in the kingdom of God. What is this? The kingdom of God here is a reference to the physical kingdom. Luke 22, you don't have to turn here, but Luke 22, 18, this is a parallel of what we just read there. For I say unto you, I will not drink of the fruit of the vine until the kingdom of God shall come. In context, I forgot to mention that this passage is talking about the Last Supper. He's doing the Last Supper. This is my blood. There's a testament that he breaks the bread and says, this is my body that's broken for you. you know, he's saying, I won't do this again until the kingdom of God, the physical kingdom. Luke 24, Luke 24, Matthew, Mark, Luke 24. How do we know this is so important? Luke 24, that this is like, this is the physical. No, it's just because he mentions wine. It's the physical. He's talking about physically drinking wine in the kingdom of God. It's not spiritual. Luke 24. Verse 36. And, as, and this is at the end, after his resurrection, he appears to him. Okay, and they start, they don't think it's him. Here's verse 36. And as they thus spake, Jesus himself stood in the midst of them and saith unto them, Peace be unto you. But they were terrified and affrighted, supposed that they had seen a spirit. Well, first of all, you can't see a spirit and you can't see a ghost, which is why they're confused. Verse 38. And he said unto them, Why are ye troubled? And why do, you, why do thoughts arise in your heart? Behold my hands and my feet, that it is I myself, handle me and see flesh. See has to do with the flesh. It has to do with the physical. For a spirit hath not flesh and bones as ye see me have. And when he had thus spoken, he showed them his hands and his feet. And why they yet believe not, they still didn't believe. For joy and wondered, he said unto them, Have ye here any meat? And they gave him a piece of a broiled fish and of a honeycomb, and he took it and did eat before them. Now I understand we're talking about drinking and he's, and he's eating, but bottom line, drinking and eating is something that's flesh. It's physical. And that's what he used to prove to them. Jesus ate the food to prove the flesh, to get them to believe that he was real. It's not spiritual. 
And people can't seem to get that. Oh, no, no, it's got to be spiritual because we want to be spiritual. We want everything to be about the body of Christ. Not everything in the Bible is about the body of Christ. Brothers, this is Christ. You want, to, you want books that are about the body of Christ? Pauline epistles. That's what you need to know. When someone gets newly saved, I tell them they need to get hardcore into the Pauline epistles. Start memorizing some of the memory verses from the Pauline epistles. And... There are some memory verses outside the Pauline epistles, but primarily the Pauline epistles, you need to start getting in there. This is Paul, the apostle to the Gentiles. He, we have our gospel through him, the Godhead through him. Uh, the fact that today we, we get the Holy Spirit, that's that kingdom of God that's spiritual, we get that through Paul. Today the kingdom of God is just the spiritual. And when he seals you, you're sealed into the day of redemption. You can't lose your salvation. We get that from Paul. Uh, the, the, the Godhead I said we get from Paul, um, getting caught up, the blessed hope, the day of Christ we get from Paul. Paul teaches us how, to, how the body of Christ is supposed to operate, about bishops, deacons, ordained elders, about gifts in the body of Christ, services, how to love your brothers and sisters in Christ. It's all there. But people are so desperate they try to grab outside the Pauline epistles and try to make everything, everything about the body of Christ today. And it isn't. We can learn from it. We can learn that, hey, God gave them truth and they rejected it. When God gives us truth today, we, don't, we shouldn't reject it. There's always something you can learn from it. But it's not talking about us. So in this passage here, it says, I will drink no more of the fruit of the vine until the day that the, I drink it new in the kingdom of God. The kingdom of God here is a reference to the physical kingdom, not the spiritual. Not because I want it to be, because you compare scripture with scripture and you say, wait a second, it's talking about physical. Drinking is a physical act. Let's bounce back over to the spiritual again. Okay. Turn to Galatians. You say, oh, you're going back to the Pauline epistles. Yes, we are. Galatians 5. Galatians 5. Verse 16. Verse 16 through 21. I don't know if you can hear it, but my, <laughs> my uh, grandfather clock that I was blessed with from family is going off. Verse 16, This I say then, walk in the Spirit, and ye shall not fulfill the lusts of the flesh. You say, what's well, a walk? Yes. Your life is, the, how I live my life today is determined by the Holy Ghost. He opens this book to me and says, this is how you're supposed to live your life. But we're walking in the Spirit. The Spirit's the one that's the boss, not the flesh. You go back to Romans 8, chapter 8. Carly minded walking after the flesh, spiritually minded walking after the Spirit. If you walk in the Spirit, in other words, after the Spirit, the Holy Spirit comes in, opens this book, and teaches you how to live. You shall not fulfill the lusts of the flesh. The Bible says, make not provisions for the flesh to fulfill the lusts thereof. If you spend your time in the Word of God and in prayer and doing what's right by God, it'll help keep the bad things at bay. When you start getting into the bad things, what do the bad things do? They keep the Word of God, your prayer life, your fellowship life, your Bible studying life, and living the life of Christ, they push it out. The flesh comes in, the lust of the flesh, try to push it out and get you back under the flesh. Verse 17, for the flesh lusteth, for the flesh lusteth at, again, or say, for the flesh lusteth against the spirit, and the spirit against the flesh, and these are contrary the one to the other, so that ye cannot do the things that ye would. It's talking about that spiritual struggle. Afterwards, there's the sign. Like I say, if you're having a spiritual struggle, you look at the, the signs, the walk, and say, okay, we can determine who won. Did the flesh win? Did the world win? Did Satan and the enemy get the better of you? Or did the Holy Spirit win? You can tell by the fruits after that struggle. It's kind of like a war. Who won the war? Verse 18, but if... But if ye be led of the Spirit, ye are not under the law. Now the works of the flesh are manifest, which are these. Adultery, fornication, uncleanness, lasciviousness, idolatry, witchcraft, hatred, variance, emulations, wrath, strife, sedition, heresies, envying, murders, drunkenness, revelings, and such like of the which I have tell you before, as I have told you in times past, we read some of them, 
that they which do such things shall not inherit the kingdom of God. They shall not inherit the kingdom of God. That spiritual fellowship. How do we have that spiritual fellowship with the Lord? We'll keep reading verse 22. But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, long-suffering, gentleness, goodness, faith, meekness, temperance. Against such there is no law. And they that are Christ have crucified their flesh with the afflictions and lusts. If we live in the Spirit, let us also walk in the Spirit. There's that struggle between the flesh and the Spirit, and that's that kingdom of God. When, you, when the Spirit's, the Holy Spirit wins out, and you're doing your best to live what's right, you have a strong connection to that kingdom of God. That spiritual kingdom. Okay. Chicken's going a little crazy. But that spiritual kingdom, okay, that's what you have a strong connection with. What gets in the way of that connection? The flesh. Worldliness. Okay. Once again, sin get in the way of salvation. I, I forgot to mention it the first time we talked about it. Sin can get in the way of salvation in the sense that the um, Bible says, if I regard iniquity in my heart, God will not hear me. This is the Psalms with Peter, or Paul. I, I'll get it wrong. King David. King David writing the Psalms. I got a little distracted by the chickens, forgive me. But King David... He writes the Psalms and says, If I hold iniquity in my heart, God will not hear me. What keeps people from getting saved today? They regard iniquity in their heart. They, want, they, they have no problem with their sin. They love their sin and worldliness. They love their way of doing things. And they don't want God's way of doing things. They want to go to heaven. But they don't want to do things God's way. It will keep them from initially getting to becoming part of that kingdom of God. You have to get saved. You have to have the Holy Spirit. You have to repent and believe in the finished work of God. Of God. Repentance towards God and faith in our Lord Jesus Christ. Confess both in prayer and ask God to save you. When God saves you, now you're part of the kingdom of God. What hinders your connection with that kingdom of God? Sin. So now that you're saved, what gets in the way? Sin. And that's what Paul's talking about here. Okay? It's spiritual. But notice, what, it's really pushed as spiritual in the Pauline epistles. It's, it's today, the time of the Gentiles... Times of the Gentiles, or time of the Gentile, today, it's the kingdom of God is not meat and drink. It's spiritual. It's righteousness. It's righteousness. It's peace. And it's joy in the Holy Ghost. There's a difference. There's a difference between kingdom of God as a physical and kingdom of God as a spiritual. Okay, last time we're going to the, the physical, okay? There's a lot of verses. This is the last time we're going to the physical. You can continue this study on your own and keep looking at the differences that when kingdom of God is mentioned in Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, in the early book of Acts versus in the latter book of Acts and the Pauline epistles. Okay? Uh, the, we're going to go back to the physical. Mark, where you see kingdom of God, and it's talking about the physical kingdom, not the spiritual so Mark 1, 14. Mark 1, 14. Matthew, Mark. Mark 1, 14. The very beginning of Mark. Mark 1, 14 says, Now that after that John was put in prison, Jesus, another way you can determine whether it's talking about the kingdom of God, the physical, or kingdom of God, the spiritual, is you compare Scripture with Scripture when it comes to the same event being told twice. Mark 1.14 Now after that John was put in prison, Jesus came into Galilee preaching the gospel of the kingdom of God and saying, The time is fulfilled and the kingdom of God is at hand. Repent ye and believe the gospel. The gospel of the kingdom of heaven. The gospel of the kingdom of God. Today we don't call our gospel the, kingdom, the gospel of the kingdom of God. It's the gospel that was revealed to Paul to give to us for the time of the Gentiles. It was a mystery. It wasn't there in the Old Testament. It wasn't there. The gospel we have today wasn't there in, the, in Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. The gospel that we have today was not there in the early book of Acts. It was revealed to Paul. It was a mystery. 
I always tell people that if it, if, if it was there in Matthew, because a lot of people like to run to John for the gospel. John, John, it's the gospel to the Gentiles. I was always taught that when, before I got truly saved and born again and started learning the Bible. No, it isn't. No, it isn't. It's a mystery. And if it was there, then Paul lied. It wasn't a mystery. If we can find it in John, without the Pauline epistles, we can find it in the early book of Acts, then Paul lied. Paul didn't lie. It's not there. Okay, the gospel that's being preached is that physical kingdom. It's a different gospel. Now, Mark 1, we read uh, 1, 14 to 15, okay, the kingdom of God. Well, it's the spiritual, because it said kingdom of God is the spiritual. No, it isn't. Matthew 3, 1, Matthew 3, 1, if you want to turn there, Matthew 3, 1 says, in those days came John the Baptist preaching in the wilderness of Judea and saying, Repent ye, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. Remember, kingdom of heaven is only mentioned in Matthew. If kingdom of God is never a reference to the physical kingdom, what happened to the physical kingdom after the book of Matthew? It just disappears. No, it doesn't. Okay. Matt, Matthew is the only time you see kingdom of heaven. Now here's the thing, you say, well still, that doesn't make any sense because you're comparing what Jesus said and did versus what John did. I start out in Matthew 3.1 to show that Matthew, it says that John was preaching the kingdom of heaven. And Mark, John gets put in prison, and then Jesus takes over, preaching the same gospel. But now it calls it the gospel of the kingdom of God. But turn to Matthew chapter 4, verse 17. Okay, John starts out preaching the kingdom of heaven. And then we get to Matthew chapter 4, verse 17. What does it say? And from that time, John gets put in prison. And from that time, the same event that's going on in Mark 1, 14, it says, From that time, Jesus began to preach and to say, Repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. So in Mark 4, 14, it says kingdom of heaven. In Mark 1, I mean Matthew 4, 17, forgive me. Matthew 4, 17, it says kingdom of heaven. Jesus preaching the kingdom of heaven. But in Mark 1, 14, it says Jesus preaching the kingdom of God. And you have these false teachings where he's preaching both the physical and the spiritual. No, he's only preaching the physical. Where's the Holy Spirit in all this? Where are people, everyone getting the Holy Spirit? They're not. We know this because Paul, or Peter, was told he had to wait until Pentecost. Thanks to Acts chapter 2. He had to wait to receive the Holy Spirit. He didn't have it. These people, in, the, in Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, they didn't have the Holy Spirit. The average person that believed. Remember he asked Peter, who do you say that I am? The, the apostles, but Peter answered and said, Thou art the Christ, the Son of the living God. He didn't have the Holy Spirit in him. He had to wait until Pentecost to receive the Holy Spirit. Jesus had to leave so that the Holy Spirit could come down. And the kingdom of God, the spiritual kingdom, can be brought in. God had, Jesus had to leave. So when you compare this, a lot of times you can compare where it says kingdom of heaven. But even in Matthew, there's times where it'll say kingdom of heaven. And then there's times it'll say kingdom of God. He's still preaching that physical kingdom. Okay. Now, where are people, I just want to throw this in there because just to make the point again, where are people, in my notes, where are people being water baptized and receiving the Holy Ghost? They're not there. Even in the early book of Acts, you have people being baptized with water and not receiving the Holy Ghost. You have people receiving the Holy Spirit and not being baptized at Pentecost. Gee, they didn't get water baptized, and they started receiving the Holy Ghost. Now you say, well, they were water baptized way back when... They weren't water baptized on the spot and receiving the Holy Ghost. Some didn't, receive, didn't get water baptized, and they received the Holy Ghost. Some received the whole, uh, didn't receive the Holy Ghost, but they got water baptized. When you receive the Holy Ghost, it has nothing to do with the water baptism. It has everything to do with the spiritual baptism. These people had to be water baptized first, and then, I'm sorry, Holy Ghost baptized. Then they had to be baptized by Jesus Christ by the, with the Holy Ghost. Two separate baptisms were going on at the same time. And eventually the water baptism, it went away. 
We have a whole study on this. But the point is, is where's the Holy Spirit? Paul said it's that the kingdom of God that they always try to run to, and I agree with this, but they're trying to mess up the rest of the Bible by making it all what Paul said in Romans. The kingdom of God is always a reference to this right here. But righteousness and peace and joy in the Holy Ghost, it's not meat and drink. It's when you receive the Holy Ghost and now you have that walk with the Lord. Sometimes people call it the pers your personal relationship with the Lord, but it's your walk with the Lord. It's that fellowship you have with the Lord by the Holy Spirit through Jesus Christ and His perfect written word. Jesus is the capital W word. This is His lowercase w word. Right. Now we'll get back to Matthew chapter 10, verse 7. Matthew chapter 10, verse 7 says, And as you go, preach, saying, The kingdom of heaven is at hand. And then over here, in Matthew 1, 14, the kingdom of God is at hand. It's the same kingdom. They're preaching the physical kingdom. Matthew eleven twelve 12 says, And from the days of John the Baptist until now, the kingdom of heaven suffereth violence, and the violent take it by force. John was trying to bring in that kingdom of heaven, the physical kingdom, but you had people coming in with violence, Remember, if you acknowledge that Jesus is the Christ, you're kicked out of the synagogues. They're trying to seek to kill people and stone people. One of the biggest people that they were seeking to kill outside of Jesus Christ was Lazarus. They wanted to kill Lazarus because he was resurrected by Jesus Christ. He was a sign that Jesus is the Christ, the Messiah, the Son of the living God. They didn't like that. Violent, take it by force. It's physical. They start getting physical to prevent the kingdom of heaven from coming in. That land, they wanted the, the power, they want it for themselves. Okay. Luke 21, 29. Luke 21, 29. Remember, you have Matthew, it's the only time kingdom of heaven is mentioned. And then you have Mark, Luke, and John. And I was shocked that when I actually took the blinders off of... You know, what I've been taught when I was in these Babel buildings using Bible perversions, what I was taught, I actually grabbed John and started going through, and you'd be shocked at how many times Son of God is mentioned. I mean, Son of Man. Son of Man is mentioned in the book of John. That when you actually get the context, it's still preaching that kingdom of heaven gospel. They're still preaching, not, they're not preaching the gospel for today. They're preaching the gospel that was for them in the early book of Acts. They're preaching the gospel that's going to come back in the time of Jacob's trouble. But here you have Luke 21 and 29. And he spake to them a parable, Behold the fig tree and all the trees. When they now shoot forth, you see and know of your own selves that summer is nigh at hand. So likewise ye, when ye see these things come to pass, know ye that the kingdom of God is at hand. But you still don't know exactly when it comes in. Not with observation or signs. You don't know exactly when it's going to come in. But you can see some things leading up to it. Verse 32, Verily I say unto you, This generation shall not pass away till all be fulfilled. Now, when I say that, it might sound like a contradiction. I'm not saying that for us. I'm talking about in the time of Jacob's trouble. They can see things that lead up to it. When Jesus was preaching the kingdom of heaven, they could see things leading up to it. Early book of Acts, they're selling all their property, and they're acting like Jesus is coming back. They, you know, they're doing the signs and wonders still. And they're preaching the kingdom of heaven gospel. I'm not talking about for us. We're not supposed to be looking for it. When I made that statement, forgive me, I was thinking in the context of who he's talking to, the Jewish people, in the time of Jacob, people in the time of Jacob's trouble, predominantly the Jewish people in the time of Jacob's trouble. The time of the Gentiles is gone. Gentiles had your shot, now it's going back to the Jews again. Can Gentiles get saved? In the Old Testament, Gentiles could get grafted in. But it was hard. It was hard. It wasn't easy like it is today. We get grafted in easily today. Repent and believe in the finished work of Jesus Christ on the cross. Confess both in prayer and ask God to save you. And when He saves you, you get grafted in. Okay. Know ye that the kingdom of God is nigh at hand. Verily I say unto you, this generation shall not pass away till all be fulfilled. 
Heaven and earth shall not pass away, but my words shall not pass away. You know how many times I've come across that verse, and kind of like people try to explain it. What generation is it? It already compares to what it's talking about. The generation of this earth as a whole, from Adam and Eve to when the earth is destroyed, that's this generation in this context. How do we know? Because he says, heaven and earth shall pass away. It's the one generation of the earth, going all the way back to Adam and Eve when the earth was created, all the way to after Satan's let loose for a season, after the day of the Lord, the Lord's day, and God rains down fire and destroys the earth. That's when the generation ends. And he says, all will be fulfilled by then. All will be fulfilled by then. And it will. And it will. That's the generation. But the kingdom of God is nigh at hand. The kingdom of heaven suffered violence, and the violent take taken by force. Nobody can take my spiritual fellowship with the Lord, that kingdom of God that Paul talks about today, that's that physical fellowship. I have to let sin into my life to get in the way of it. I have to start doing wrong. I have to get into the lust of the flesh to, to get in the way of it. It's all about, that's not all about me, but I'm saying it's me. It's my fault. If anything happens with that physical spell at fellowship, you look back, it's my fault. What gets in the way? Lust of the flesh. The flesh. The world. Covetousness. Idolatry. Love of money. Putting things down here. That's the covetousness. Making things down here. Lowercase g gods because they're more important than the Lord. The world's way is more important than God's way. The flesh's way becomes more important than God's way. So there's two, re two things. And then Satan and his ministers will come in and start sowing seeds of lies and deception and temptation using the flesh and the world to get you away from the Lord. But those are the three enemies. Those are the three things that get in the way of your fellowship with the Lord, your walk with the Lord. You're inheriting that kingdom of God, that spiritual kingdom. But nobody can come and take it away from me. They can come take this from me. They can take the book from me. You know, they can put chains on me and throw me in prison. But they can't mess with my physical or spiritual walk with the Lord. They can only mess with my physical life. And we've had, if you look through the history, we've had people, brethren, martyrs, people have gone through, brethren that have gone through such hard times because they did. They attacked them fit with the flesh and tried to get them to turn on God. They attacked their flesh, they enticed their flesh, they tempted their flesh. So, brothers and sisters Christ, please, please understand, there's a difference. We need to rightly divide. We can have one word, one term, and it can be, have different, more than one meaning. Kingdom of God can be a reference to this physical kingdom. Kingdom of God can be a reference to the spiritual kingdom. We have to rightly divide. Paul talks about today, kingdom of God being that spiritual kingdom. It's not a reference to a physical kingdom today in the Pauline epistles. Be careful, be careful, okay, that we're rightly dividing. And like I said, God opens my heart. He starts sh showing me truth. Thy word have I hid in my heart. The more I stay in this book, the more God opens things to me. The more I keep my life clean, too, and live a life of Christ, God will open things to me. But like I said, things of the world get in. They get in the way. I spend less time in this. But this is Christ. There could be time in your life where things are getting in the way, and you're spending less time with the Lord one-on-one. -on -one and His Word in prayer. But there's a difference between the Kingdom of God as it is today, the spiritual Kingdom, versus the Kingdom of God in Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, and the early book of Acts, which is this physical. I know there's probably a lot more examples, but we're going to stop right here and let you, brother and Christ, continue it, comparing the two, and going through the Kingdom of God. Now that you know, hey, wait a minute, if it says C, it's physical. If it says Son of Man, if it's talking about the Son of Man, or you know, it's talking about the physical kingdom. Son of David. Capital S, Son of David. It's talking about the physical kingdom. When it's talking about drinking, wait a minute, that's something you physically do. It's talking about the physical kingdom. Don't be deceived by these people who love to tear from Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John and make it about the body of Christ today. And it's not. It's not. Right. Be careful. Be not deceived. Make sure that you focus on your spiritual walk with the Lord. The kingdom of God, as, as Paul says it is. Not meat and drink, but righteousness and peace and joy in the Holy Ghost. Your walk with the Lord, looking for that blessed hope with the life that you're living.
preparing for the judgment seat of Christ. Don't fall back into making the kingdom of God, um, getting back to looking for the kingdom of God as it's a reference to the physical kingdom. Don't get distracted by the time of Jacob's trouble. Don't. Well, there's going to come a day where we're going to get caught up and you're going to be sitting there going, man, I wasted a lot of time with the time of Jacob's trouble. I got so distracted by what's going on in the world trying to, you know, instead of living for Christ, I started getting distracted by the world. I started getting fearful. Notice it says peace and joy in the Holy Ghost, not fear. God's not giving us a spirit of fear. But I think it says power, love, and of a sound mind. The kingdom of God is not meat and drink, but righteousness and peace and joy in the Holy Ghost. That's where you need to be focusing, brothers and sisters Christ. But for this study, there's a difference. There's a difference. Please, if you have any comments, make any co leave any comments in the comment section. If you try to disagree or if you want to say there's here's this over here, this over here, I'll talk with you. I'll fellowship with you. And I'll turn it into a teaching mode. I'll try my best to be peaceful and meekness instructing those that oppose themselves. So... Um, we can sing another hymn, because this was a short study. We can sing another hymn. We did Day by Day. How about we sing one of my old favorites also. Um, I don't know if I can find it. But there's coming a day. That's the one I like. There's coming a day. We sung this one, and then the next one over. What a day that'll be. What a, it's not there's coming a day, but it's what a day that'll be. Okay? But this is Christ. We need to focus on that kingdom of God as the, as the spiritual kingdom, looking for that blessed hope. That's where you need to be spending your time. Your walk with the Lord. If you're a man in ministry, the ministry comes second. The, your love for your brothers and sisters in Christ come third. Your love for the lost world when it comes to preaching the gospel to them and being a light for them, an example, a good example for them to lead them to Christ comes forth. Me, myself, and I come dead last. Watch out for that. Some of the brethren are starting to fall in the trap of putting themselves first. Me, myself, and I come last. And we're looking for that blessed hope with the life that we're living. All right. Let's see if my sing is not too bad. All right. There is coming a day when no heartache shall come. No more clouds in the sky. No more tears to dim the eye. All is peace forevermore on that happy golden shores. What a day, glorious day that will be what a day that will be when my Jesus I shall see and I look upon his face the one who saved me by his grace when he takes me by the hand and leads me through the promised land what a day glorious day that will be There'll be no sorrow there, no more burdens to bear, no more sickness, no pain, no more parting over there. And forever I will be with the one who died for me. What a day, glorious day that will be. What a day that will be when my Jesus I shall see and I look upon his face the one who saved me by his grace when he takes me by the hand and leads me through the promised land what a day glorious day that will be what a day Glorious day that will be. Brothers and sisters Christ, is that the day you're looking for with the life that you're living? I've had people say, Brothers and Christ, oh, I want that day. Does your life prove that you're looking for that blessed hope? Or does your life say, I'm looking for that time of Jacob's trouble? 
I'm getting caught up in the kingdom of heaven, the kingdom of God as the physical, and I need to get back to the kingdom of God as the spiritual. I need to get back to my walk with the Lord, my fellowship with the brethren, my service to Christ. If you're not, I encourage you again, Brother Strife, get out there with gospel tracts. Okay, leave them everywhere you go. You don't might not be called to be a street preacher, but you can leave gospel tracts everywhere you go. You can have a gospel tract on you just in case the door opens and you can hand it to somebody. Are you looking for that blessed hope with the life that you're living? That's what matters. So I'm going to end this with grace and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ be with you all and my love for you which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. We have an email for this ministry and you can leave comments in the comment section. By all means, you want to talk with me, it's okay to disagree with me, but we all need to be on the same page when it comes to this book. And we all need to be looking for that blessed hope. So I'll see you in the next study and I pray all is well with all of you, brothers and sisters Christ, especially in these last days that all is well. Okay. And I'll see you in the next study.